Hey everybody, sorry it's been a little while. Um, I intended to do this video a couple weeks ago, but I actually got super sick and could barely talk for like a week. So I'm pretty much back to feeling like a human being. So hopefully I can get through this lesson without my voice failing partway through. But anyway, um, last week we left off with the extended chords, which is really just this idea that you can take a basic chord, you know, a seventh chord or whatever, and you can continue on with it. You can continue to stack notes on top in thirds, and you can build a ninth chord or an eleventh chord or a thirteenth chord or whatever. And I went ahead and kind of redrew out that little graph here, this time with the ruler, though it still managed to come out a little crooked. But anyway, here it is, and it's just kind of the basic structure of that chord building idea. One of the really important parts was that when you play these chords, you tend to think of the the first part of the chord, the uh, seventh chord part, as the core part of the chord. And, and every, every different type of seventh chord gets its own name. There's a name for every little configuration there. So for a major seventh chord, you know, on a, on a G you'd have this, minor seventh would look like that, or dominant seventh, or whatever. And when it comes to these notes, the extensions, they're not part of that name. They're kind of treated totally separately. So for example, if I wanted to do a like D minor nine chord, I'd play a D minor seven, that's the core part of the chord. And then I would just stick a nine on there, which in the case of D would be the note E. If I wanted to do a D major nine chord, I have a D major seven now, but the nine doesn't change. If I wanted to do a D dominant nine, same thing, that 9 is still in the same place. And the same would be true for an 11th or a 13th or whatever. So the obvious question is, how do you change these notes? How do you move the 9 or the 11th around or whatever? Now, technically, you know, this 9 that I played, that one right there, technically that's a major 9th. You know, the 9 works the same way that you know a, a major 3rd and a minor 3rd does. There's a major 9. If we lowered it, it'd be a minor 9. If we raised it, it'd be an augmented 9. But you pretty much never talk about it that way. It'd be really confusing. Because if I, you know, for example, had a D minor 9 chord again, and I wanted to lower the 9th, what would I call it? You know, a D minor minor 9? And it'd be even worse for like an 11th. I'd have a D minor 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 11 or, or whatever. So that doesn't work too well. In the case of the 9th, 11th, and 13th, we just talk about them as being sharp or natural or flat. You know, so a 9, if we just mean a, a natural 9, we just say 9. If you want to raise it, it'd be a sharp, lower it, it'd be a flat. So with that, with that D minor 9 chord, if I wanted to lower the 9th, I'd have some kind of D minor chord or D minor 7 chord, and I'd have a flat 9 on it. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Now, the, the way you name these, the way you write them down, the way you talk about them, is a little bit cumbersome. So if this next part seems difficult or frustrating, just remember the, the core concept, it's just this. It's just that you're gonna take these notes and move them around. The way you name them, it's, it's kind of annoying. But here's how you do it. If I have a, we'll say, uh, C dominant 11 chord, like this. I would write that out as C11. Remember that the first part of the chord gives you that seventh chord, and if there's no symbol there, it means dominant. And then that last part of it, the number that tells you how far out you're going. So you're, you're kind of stacking the chord notes all the way out to the 11th, so C dominant 11. If I wanted to, let's say, raise the ninth, you create a, a sharp nine, or we'll say flat nine. It's a little bit more normal. I wanted to create a flat nine. I would just stick that on the end. I'd just say flat nine. Look at that. And pretty often these are written in parentheses, so it look like that. Um, sometimes not. They're almost always written in superscript, so it's kind of tiny and raised up a little bit. Although. If you're reading some random blog article, a lot of people don't know how to make the text superscript, so you'll just see this big, long mess of letters and numbers, but that's usually how it's written. 
Now if I want to do something like a G dominant 13 sharp 9 sharp 11, it would look something like that. Um, G dominant 13 sharp 9 sharp 11. There you go. Basically you just stick the alterations after the chord, usually in parentheses. Now one kind of weird thing is that in jazz music, oftentimes they'll treat the fifth this way. They'll use like a sharp five or a flat five. So you'll see, so, oops. So you'll see something like a uh, E minor seven flat five, which you know looks like this. In the classical world, you just call that an E half diminished seven. It would be written like that. I actually don't really know why it tends to be different in jazz versus classical. Maybe some jazz musician can chime in, but just realize that they like to do that with fifths. A lot of times the, the five will be sharp five or flat five and it's stuck after the chord, just like an alteration. So this is all well and good, but the weird part is when you have, we'll just say a, you know, F dominant nine, so that, and we want to say flat the nine. You would think, okay, we could just stick it after, you know, after the nine and do F nine flat nine, but that's obviously pretty confusing. You could try to put it before the nine and do something like F flat nine, but that looks really weird too because it seems like we're doing some kind of F flat dominant chord or something. So the way you do this is you basically back up a note. So what I mean is, you know, normally if I'm trying to write an F dominant nine chord, I put nine on the end. I say, you know, nine is the farthest it's going, so we'll use a nine. But since I want to alter that nine, I'll instead write it as F dominant seven with a flat nine, like that. And you said, same thing, there's an F dominant seven, or F dominant nine, and there it is with a flat nine. So you basically just back up a note and then, you know, use that other note as an alteration. So if I was gonna do, get rid of these, um, a D dominant 11, I'd write it like that and play it like that. If I wanted to flat the nine, I would just write D11 flat nine, like that. If I wanted to, let's say, sharp the 11, I can't write 11 as that last number anymore because I'm gonna alter it. So I'd write D dominant nine, what did I say, sharp the 11? Yeah, sharp 11. So, same thing. Um, if I wanted to do both, I'd have to back up even further, so it would be become a D dominant seven, and then sharp nine, sharp 11, something like that. Anyway, like I said, it's kind of cumbersome and a little bit confusing. If you have questions, just ask, and I'll try to give more examples in the comments or something. Like I said, don't get too hung up. It's just the way we do it, so. There's that. Now, I, I should say this, even though I kind of don't want to, uh, the term altered chord, it, it has kind of a hazy definition. Um, in the kind of classical world, the term altered chord pretty much just means any chord that's been changed so that it's, it's no longer one of the chords that normally shows up in your key. So for example, you know, I could be in the key of D minor, playing around doing whatever, and I decide to throw in a D major chord, like that, um, that would be considered an altered chord. It's not normally part of my key, I've altered it. And in this case, it's a it's also a borrowed chord. It's a chord that comes from a different mode. You know, it's actually, I'm using a chord from the major key. Um, so it's, I could call it a borrowed chord, I could also say it's an altered chord. That's kind of the classical way of looking at it. In jazz, that's also kind of true, but it at least seems like they usually don't 
label that as an altered chord. They generally identify, you know, this kind of thing as an altered chord, a chord that has these alterations, you know, strung after it. And that can be a little bit weird sometimes because most of the time, when you do this kind of thing, when you alter a chord by doing a sharp nine or sharp 11 or something, it usually winds up being a chord that's not normally in your key, but not always. For example, if I'm in the key of C major and I do a C major nine sharp 11, which is this, um, that is definitely an altered chord by either definition. I altered the 11th and it's definitely not in my key. I don't, I don't normally have an F sharp in the key of C. But if I then play an F chord and I do the same thing where I play an F, F major nine sharp 11, um, that chord is altered in the sense that, you know, it has a, a sharp 11, but it actually fits in the key. So I'm not really sure what most people would say. It kind of depends on what theory professor you talk to or which dead guy's book you read. Um, it doesn't matter too much. Just in your head, have a little asterisk next to the definition of altered. It could kind of be either. So anyway, that gives us a way to talk about this stuff. You know, we can correctly identify or name, you know, whatever chord. Now on paper, you know, taking a chord and saying sharp nine or flat nine, whatever, it all is perfectly simple. But in practice, a lot of these actually don't make that much sense. And I'll show you a couple. So let's say I'm building a chord, let's do it on C, and I'm gonna do a C minor seven sharp nine. Okay, this would be a C minor nine, just normal. Here would be a C minor seven sharp nine. Okay, you notice, fix my audio, you notice that that sharp nine is just my minor third. It's literally the same note. So calling this an extension and saying it's an altered chord with a sharp nine doesn't make any sense. I'm just doubling up a note. That's why you, you never see this chord written somewhere because it it just doesn't really make any sense. Now a slightly different issue, if I had a C major 11 chord, you rarely ever see major 11s either. This isn't an altered chord or anything, it's just, well, like I said, that's a little bit debatable depending on where you're coming from, but you hardly ever see a major 11 chord because with, with this major chord, you have this major third in it, and this, you know, 11th, is really the fourth moved up an octave, but it tends to not sound very good. Now, every time I say this in any lesson, someone's always like, I love that sound. My favorite band is called the Major 11s or whatever. All I can say is that it's very rarely done. If you happen to like it, that's you know, fantastic for you, but most music avoids this. Um, and in fact, most musicians, if you said, hey, play a major 11 chord, what they would usually do is leave out the third and you play it like this. That's generally how a major 11 is interpreted. Now, if you looked at this, you might think that kind of seems more like a, a suspended fourth chord with a ninth. And that's probably a better thing to call it because it does kind of make more sense. But I don't know, some people just kind of choose to write it however. Don't get too hung up on it, just know that major 11 chords, they sound like this, which I don't like, whatever. Um, now, if you do that sharp 11 like I talked about, this is still not a very common chord, but I think at least it works a little bit better. Uh, although, often enough, you'll end up leaving out the fifth to kind of avoid that sound. And that's just kind of a practical thing, but even so, the uh, sharp 11 chord is, is kind of rare. In general, actually, most of the time when you have these alterations, when you're doing a sharp nine or a sharp 11 or whatever, it almost always happens on a dominant chord. You know, a chord like this. Because this chord is designed for tension, it's going to sound very tense and resolve somewhere. So, especially in jazz, this is where they like to just go crazy and kind of do all sorts of stuff that, that sounds weird. You know, you could have your sharp nine here, which a lot of people call this the, the Hendrix chord. Jimi Hendrix liked to use this. 
and get that sharp 11 in there too. Get this really kind of crunchy sound between the fifth and the sharp 11 or whatever. Although you know, might you might end up leaving out the fifth. It just depends. But for dominant chords, that's where a lot of these alterations tend to happen. Um, for just kind of normal majors and minors, they are usually just a plain old ninth. Um, like I said, elevenths don't happen very often on a major chord. Um, it could happen on a minor chord, and those are fine. Um, and they hardly ever go to the 13th either, because that also can sound a little bit strange. Now one thing you might notice about something like that Hendrix chord I just played, um, this one, if you actually look at this, and I kept saying how you know chords are built up in thirds, it could be you know a major third or a minor third or whatever. Um, by by having this minor seven note in here, you remember I'm doing a dominant seven chord, but this interval is a minor seven. By having this and doing a sharp nine, these these two notes are actually farther apart than a third. Um, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with this chord. It's actually a pretty popular one. But um, it's no longer a tertian chord. The, the thirds are, well, they're not thirds anymore. This one isn't. So I'm going to save that discussion for kind of another lesson. I'd like to talk about a lot of different things like mixed thirds and added tones and a lot of the non-tertian harmony because I think it deserves its own little world to explore. Um, but just realize that by pushing these notes around, you can wind up doing these sort of things, where you push them too far and it's no longer a tertian chord or whatever. So like I said, we'll deal with that later. And then the other part of this is more of the practical side. Like if you're trying to write music, how do you use these chords in a way that's compelling? And we kind of talked about, you know, what what makes sense and what doesn't. Like I said, you know, a major 11 chord doesn't usually sound too good, but there's the sort of rubber meets the road part of it. I'm writing a song, where do I put these and what do they do and how do they change the way the music works? And that is something we'll explore in some of the future lessons that'll be more focused on the practical side of theory rather than the more abstract, you know, what's what kind of thing. So anyway, I think that's it for now. Um, I will not be taking a, another month to get the next video out unless I get sick again, which I hope doesn't happen. Anyway, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.